Welcome to TDM Imported. Hey, what's up? Welcome to the JDM Imported Podcast. Uh, I'm Dante Prinzo, owner-operator of Elusive Auto Company, and today we are going to cover an update on the FD. Uh, you might be getting sick of that, but I'm not, so just deal. Uh, I'm excited about this car, super low mileage, and now the patina's gone. I know everyone loves that buzzword, but the the minty is there. Uh coming out of paint almost ready to be debuted the interior is looking beautiful so little update on that it might be a long update i don't know we'll see where it goes i'm gonna start chatting about that but then another thing i want to get into is uh is some cars to be excited about uh so some that are on the precipice if you will of of being legal still have to be patient and um maybe another car that you don't know much about but I read Wikipedia, and I feel like I know a little bit. No, I've, I've known about these cars for, uh, for a while now. I've always loved them, and, uh, and we're going to get into it. You know, it's something a little different, maybe something that you're not into. It's not a race car. It's not a VIP car. It's kind of some weird in-between, but uh, cool nonetheless. So, anyways, update on the FD. So, uh, again, you know, have the 92 RX-7 uh, FD, uh, the Affini. So, and for those of you that don't know, I mean, that's just basically the, uh, the branding uh, Mazda used for that year, I believe, uh, 92. And then after that, they, it turned into the, uh, just, you know, simply the Mazda RX-7. So, and, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. They, uh, you know, in, in Japan, these companies, they've, they've done that. And I think it's a smart thing to really market, you know, and we've gotten into it with, uh, I mean, one that I can think off the top of my head is like with, with Hyundai and uh, Genesis to kind of separate branding for a car that's maybe out of their norm or out of their wheelhouse demographic, if you will. Uh, and Japan's been doing this for years. You know, they've had uh, a lot of mergers back in the day. Uh, I've mentioned it before, you know, the, the Prince, I believe it's Prince Motor Company. I think they're, they make airplane engines now, but uh, it was back in the late 60s, mid 60s. Uh, that they merged with Nissan, and that's why we have the Skyline uh, and the Gloria, you know. So, um, you know, a lot of movement there, small companies merging with, with larger, and then also, like I said, the branding. I, I just think it's really smart. You know, with Mazda, uh, they've done the Affini program, uh, which is a little more performance-minded. Um, Enos, which, um, you know, the Roadster, uh, I know the Roadster was under that. Uh, which which is our Miata, the uh, the Cosmo, which is the one, you know, I was like dancing around earlier, but uh, that's the car that I want to talk about a little bit later. And it's legal. You don't have to wait for it. They're harder to find, but super cool cars. But anyways, um, so I know they had the Cosmo, they had the, uh, like the MX-3 equivalent that we had. I think it was called the Presso. Uh, they had the a sedan under the Enos, so really the Enos, I think a cargo uh, vehicle as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, I just, I just think it's interesting how they had different branding. You know, and it wasn't just Mazda and Nissan that did this. You know, other companies did as well to kind of separate, you know, maybe the performance or maybe the luxury brand or wh whatever it may be. So, um, so anyways, uh, getting back to the FD. So, the FD, I... Um, you know, so I got this car. I was really excited about it because it has 33,000 miles on it. So a little over 55,000 kilometers and um, basically stock, which, you know, I don't know uh, how many of you listening out there into rotaries. Uh, you know, they're definitely they can be reliable. Contrary to popular belief, like you can make one last if you know how to take care of it. Um if you, uh, you know, if you keep the mods, well, I mean, even if you mod them, if you do the, the right cooling mods and, uh, and they're tuned properly, I mean, they're super thirsty engines. I mean, they, they can, they can live. I mean, the nice thing is about those motors is, I mean, troubleshooting is very, I don't want to say it's simple because there's, you know, I, I guess it, it depends on the person. I mean, some people are going to think they're overly complicate, complicated because it's not what you're used to. 
you know, used to a traditional block, you're used to a, a valve train, uh, things that it doesn't have. I mean, it's, it's block essentially is a sandwich of plates and rotor housings, you know? So I, I think sometimes people say it's overcomplicated, not because it is, because it's just different. You know, it's, um, it, it's not the norm. It's not where you're used to. So, um, but my thought is, I mean, really with them, with eliminating the, the valve train, you, you know, no uh, timing chain and, and all that stuff to deal with. I mean, it's, uh, it's a very simple setup. Uh, so troubleshooting's, you know, really easy on those cars. Uh, so, do, the, you know, the rotary engine doesn't really scare me. Uh, and low mileage ones, yes, I mean, they could be... They could be great. They could not, just like any other car. You know, sometimes if cars sit too long, they're not driven. Uh, seals go bad. This car, uh, you know, I was lucky. I mean, really, no smoke, perfect idle. And, um, you know, even if I had to do some work to the engine, not a big deal because I knew the chassis was all original paint. So there hasn't been any accidents. It's all original panels. There's no filler anywhere. Uh, it's the original. And I came to find out single stage paint that they used back in the day so no wonder it's you know had some fading on the roof from sun and it is black which gets hella hot uh obviously so um but man being under this thing i mean i'm not going to say this thing looks like it rolled off the showroom floor i mean it's you know 26 years old but the hardware you know in in certain spots there's there's rust on the hardware no rust on like zero rust on the chassis but there's certain spots i mean some things to look for there like around the head headlights the pop up headlights there you know there is very poor what i would call poor drainage from the factory from uh from where you know if you want to call them the skins we'll call them the skins sounds a little sexy but uh that sit on top of the the headlights or at least to cover them uh, that gap between there and the hood, the, the water kind of rolls down there and doesn't have m much place to go. You know, it's, it's guided a little bit, but it basically rolls in there, kind of sits on this bracket. Uh, it keeps everything localized, like the bolts are rusted, but that's it. So, you know, and I replace some bolts just because, like I said, this car is just so minty mechanically in the bushings and underneath it. And I mean, not even scraped up underneath it. And I'm so used to seeing cars lowered. I mean, wheel wells are destroyed underneath, you know, whatever kind of paneling diffusers from the factory, they're usually scraped up. I mean, just looks gorgeous. I mean, even the hardware underneath the front splitter, because it has the R1, uh, the R1 splitter there. And for those of you that don't know, I mean, it's just, uh, it's basically just a, that little plastic trim piece on the front bumper, uh, which is functional. It actually adds two little dunks dunks uh i well hey i've been watching a lot of basketball i got on my mind nba playoffs what are you gonna do but uh yeah two little ducks that uh that are actually functional and speaking of ducks i've been around these cars enough but you, you know really when you have one in 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 person and you start start really going into it and you know like any brackets that i see are kind of corroded uh you know like i did a, a fluid flush and you know, had the battery out and just uh, kind of checking everything over, checking uh, checking the lines. I uh, did a pressure test for the coolant system and things like that. So I had to take some parts out, some shrouds and whatnot of the engine bay. And I mean, you just start seeing it. It's like there's there's a air duct, no joke, that goes from the intake. There's kind of like this box that sits on top that funnels air to the intake that takes it from the front of the car, from that front grill. And then there's also just a little tributary that kind of breaks off and funnels air to the battery. I guess just to keep the battery cool and happy. I mean, I don't know the functionality, but I don't care. That type of engineering is just something you have to appreciate. And even at that, I mean, talking about the battery, not a sexy thing to talk about. Always an afterthought. I used to hate spending money on dry cells, you know, just because uh, they'd always be dead anyway because, you know, race car. Uh, but the, uh, the battery tray is, uh, it, it's some kind of, it's like a fiberglass composite. I mean, it's, there's hair in it. I mean, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. It's like a weave and it's, it weighs nothing. It weighs ounces, it's super rigid and thick. And it's, it's a battery tray and, it, and the battery is totally enclosed by plastic. I mean, it's really, the car was really engineered well. Uh, it, it, and it helps you understand why it might not have survived, you know, because it, it had to be expensive in the States, you know, and it's, uh, 
it's one of those cars that you really see that value. And, and for them to maybe make more money on it, uh, it's a small market to begin with. And then if if you have a car that's over-engineered, as that is for, I think, that price, price point, uh, to ask more, you know, in the early 90s, I mean, forget about it, you know. So I get it. I get it, you know. So in, in a, uh, you know, 95 was the last year in the States, and 2002 was the last day in, in Japan. And really... Another thing that's cool and, and just what I love about uh, the Japanese car culture uh, and kind of business model is, you know, when they have a successful platform, they don't need to they don't need to put sprinkles on it every three years to keep people interested. You know, I mean, we're talking about RX-7, so let's just stick with that. I mean, a body style. So there started, you know, a year before here. And went to 2000, from 92 to 2002, and largely looked the same. You know, a, a, I mean, we're talking a, a, a slight overhaul. I'm not even going to say overhaul. We're, some body panels, uh, the, the front end, the, you know, the, um, the driving lights got updated with some projectors uh, in 99. And then there's, you know, the, the Spirit R, this, the, uh, the spoiler upgrade, things like that. But, I mean, overall, interior Roofline doors, the rear. I mean, it's the same car from '92 to 2002. Uh, and you got to respect that. You got to appreciate that. But you know, a lot of heritage with those cars. And, and I mean, that's just one of many platforms. I mean, we could go on. We could talk about the same thing with Supras and you know, Skylines. They they did a redesign uh, more frequently. But uh, you know, I think that's a different story. You know, just because of the. Um, the initiation of the R32 was really for uh, in that production race program. They needed 5,000 units, and that's why the R32 is so beautiful, you know, the GTR. But, um, yeah, we'll get into that in a little bit, but just to, just to kind of wrap up the FD. So it's, uh, it's just about done with paint. Well, and here's a little story, too, uh, for anyone that has, knows, doesn't know, just curious, who cares, the door clearance tolerance on these cars is extremely tight. So if you look at them from the outside, it has, you know, your standard door gap, right? Uh, which, which this car does. And it's very consistent. And again, the panels are clean. The bolts for all the fenders don't look like they've been touched. I mean, really, I, I love the condition. This was clearly a responsibly owned car uh, by someone that just wanted to take care of it. You know, service history, liked it. You know, it's kind of like the difference. I mean, if you equate it to someone in the States here, uh, you know, you have the people that buy, what to say something kind of generic, the, the buy Corvettes, and that's like the car they've lusted after their whole life. They've retired, and they just want to buy it, and all they do is wash it and take it to Cars and Coffee, and it's like mint, mint. And then you have the others that want to buy one that's five years old, gut it, you know, in a half mile, race it. This was definitely the person that wanted to keep this thing minty and just really appreciate it for what it was. Uh, it does not look driven hard. The alignment does not show any, any signs of that or an aggressive alignment. The tire wear is perfect. Bushings are perfect. I mean, it's silly, but, uh, but anyways, the tolerances on the doors. So the gaps look normal. The way the fenders are cut, they're kind of in, in, and they're beautiful. They're they're designed really well. Instead of just like kind of ending where the skin is, they kind of wrap into the door jam. You know, so it's it's kind of a nice fluid line. If you have the door open, you can see it's 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 really nice. I mean, the metal work there, uh, not lazy at all. But because of that, when the door opens, it it gets really close to that curve. And since this thing from the factory has that single stage, super super thin paint, and since I had it repainted. Of course, it was completely sanded down. I had painless dent repair on any of the door dings. I didn't want filler in this car. Uh, took all the molding out. Like, really took the time with this. But I had them put extra clear on. Uh, you know, c standard paint jobs, they might be, you know, two coats or so of clear. Uh, they did four on, on my car because it is just a gorgeous deep black. And I wanted to have some room, too, uh, to do some kind of wet sanding and just... You know, so it has longevity. So whoever has this car next, they can uh, they can detail it for years and not worry about it. That you know they can do their annual uh, you know cutting polish or, or whatever clay bar. Uh, we can do another park podcast on that. I have fallen down a rabbit hole with detailing, even though I don't detail my own cars, personal cars. I really enjoy doing it with these older ones for sale, and uh, have really 
uh, fallen into that. So, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, I wanted to just uh, have a lot of room to work with, a lot of gloss, a lot of shine uh, for years of enjoyment. Because of that, that little bit of thickness exploited the tight tolerance between the door and the, and the fender. So whenever they were, um, they painted it, they cured it, they opened the door. And I mean, we're talking a slight rub, a slight, slight rub on the very outside of the door skin. Uh, and I checked both sides and, and they were one, I, I mean, they look even, it's, it's hard to tell with, with the eye, but I mean, we're talking like, uh, a, 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 a couple thousandths of a millimeter, uh, difference. But, um, so, you know, they opened it, the paint was soft. It, uh, it scratched up the clear coat. Uh, they obviously apologized. They're going to respray the door, uh, the clear on that, which is really nice of them. Um, uh, you know, because quite honestly, I think it could be sanded down with like 1,500, 3,000, and no one would ever know, especially because it's kind of on the inside of that seam right there. But, um, but yeah, it, you know, and all I simply did was, uh, you know, I just loosened up a couple bolts on the fenders. And uh, the fender actually, it didn't even look like it moved. I just, I loosened some bolts uh, on the top, it, well, really all around put a little pressure against it. The door gap's exactly the same, but it just gave just that little bit, that couple thou of gap, because that's how close the to tolerances were. You know, you stacked up the paint there and it rubbed just a little bit, uh, which I thought was interesting. I've never really seen it, but again, I wanted to share that story and not because I think it's helpful to me because, you know, if any of you is like, hey, you know, I I listen to this podcast, like this guy's got this car for sale. If any of you send me someone that's looking for it, I mean, you know, uh, I, I don't think this helps anything that says, hey, the door had to be uh, repainted, but the whole car was anyway, and I wanted to make it perfect. So, uh, and I wanted to share this just because I, I think it's it's interesting. I mean, I've, I've never come across anything. Uh, they they have at the, uh, at the body shop a couple times with some really high line cars, uh, older, older cars, though, uh, it seems to be kind of a common thing with well-made older cars that use single stage. And uh, yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised the difference of uh, just some paint thickness, you know. But anyways, that's getting fixed up and I should have the car next week. Uh, I'm working on an interior right now, which has that uh, so stupid. It has that uh, like that rubberized coating and that coating just gets destroyed. Y you know, I mean. Well, I don't say I don't want to say destroyed because I'm sure when it was new it was fine and there was a reason for this coating, and I, I see from from the element of of uh, you know plastic to plastic connections it would dampen any squeaking and noise and cracks and stuff. So I get that I get why Mazda used it, but man, this stuff just deteriorates after you know 20 or so years and uh, and you can really see it. people's watch band on the center console will just gouge it. And uh, I mean, you can you can scrape it with your fingernail, you know, on pretty much most FDs, unless they lived in a garage their whole life. Uh, and even then, uh, I've still seen them scratched up. So especially the door handles. So anyways, since it's low mileage and the exterior is going to look so nice on it, I decided to, uh, to overhaul the interior, which was a pain to take everything apart, but uh, learned a lot. I, again, it was, it was really the, the way they put that car together was impressive. But uh, and I found that acetone so if anyone's coming across this because uh, i know they use this rubberized coating in a lot of different cars and you can sand and sand and you know it clogs sandpaper it's like sanding rubber so and, and you don't want to use anything too aggressive because then it's going to gouge the plastic and then you don't want to sand into the plastic because some of these plastics are i mean they're thin they're old they're brittle so uh, you know i don't want to cut into it too much so uh i did a couple test spots with acetone and acetone i mean for all intents and purposes, uh, it's like nail polish remover. But it doesn't seem, I'm not a chemist, but I did some test pieces, uh, and it doesn't seem to do anything to the plastic underneath. It just simply takes away the rubber. It still takes some some sanding and whatnot. I use Scotch-Brite pads or some 3M scuff pads. I use uh, like a medium, like a coarse a medium, and I'll probably finish with a fine. But, uh, but anyway, I just soak in an acetone, those pads, and, and it comes off pretty easily. You know, so I'm going to do that and then use uh, SEM, SEM interior products. Highly recommended. I've used them on multiple cars. I mean, this stuff, I mean, it's legit dye for plastics. You spray it on the plastic, and when that dries, get your fingernail out, sharpen it even, get it on a metal, do whatever. Make it raunchy and just 
try to gouge into that plastic and it's going to be it's it's not going to do anything it's going to be just like a factory plastic wood uh if not better you know so i've used this stuff on uh the last skyline i had uh laurel uh which i had to get paint matched but i'll tell you really good product super i mean expensive uh for what it is but great product uh easy to put on it just it basically any kind of texture any texture from the factory you can still see it doesn't build thick because it really soaks into the plastic but so uh so i got some of that in the factory colored black in uh, in, the, in the factory sheen and everything so it'll uh i think it'll be better than new you know i'm gonna spray the plastics they're gonna look black but they're not gonna have that rubberized coating so they should last longer especially because the center console is just all up in your business you know watches rings i mean you're just gonna be kind of resting stuff on them so uh, I think it'll be more durable. So I'm excited about that. But but that's that. So uh, I did have a question. I did have a question that I wanted to share. Um, so I kind of talked about this on the last podcast a little bit. Uh, was it the last one? No, it was two ago. But, uh, you know, talking about, um, you know, what kind of car person you are. You know, are you an expert or you're a general- generalist? And, uh, you know, so I was thinking of something else. And... Um, well, maybe it's not so much a question. Maybe this is more of a share. But uh, I find myself doing this too, you know, going to car shows, going to meets, which I love. You know, we all love going and we like showing off our cars. We like learning about cars, just being around other people that have the same interest. You know, and, and what I find is that, uh, and I think this stems off that, are you a generalist or an expert? Uh, you know, I find that uh, that there's car lovers that... Uh, that are more concerned with being right than getting it right. So what I mean by that, and I, and I think I've done it too, uh, and I see a lot of this, I mean, because again, if you're on social media and you're out there and you post something, I mean, we all know we've all had it happen to us or maybe we've done it to other people, and you're not completely accurate on something or maybe uh, someone doesn't get context of, of your picture or your post and they'll criticize, you know, the way your towels folded, the way the car's in the sun, it wasn't dry all the way, or, you know, whatever, since we're all experts, right? Um, but, you know, I think a lot of times it's, you know, I, I was having some discussions with car guys and girls, uh, actually it was a pretty big group, but, um, <clears throat> you know, and, and you definitely get the sense that, you know, when we're discussing, uh, just kind of discussing the cars we like, I mean, unless you know what, because I, I like to kind of stay with a the theme, so let's stick with, like, the rotary thing, right? And kind of, you know, talk about the things you like about it. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm not saying it's the best engine or the most efficient. I just, I think it's cool, you know? I think it's a great option for people, you know? And I think uh, a lot of, there's a lot of misnomers just by miseducation uh, or undereducation, you know, of the car. And, uh, and you find a lot of people that instead of listening and instead of, trying to see uh, maybe a different perspective, a different point of view, they, um, they're they more concerned with being right than getting it right. You know, I mean, to me, if, if, if I misspeak, I will fall on my sword every time because, again, I don't think I have any value in what I know because anyone could Google this shit. Not a big deal. Same for anyone else, you know? And, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just an interesting thing, an observation I've made that... Uh, you know, maybe just something to be mindful of. I've, I've been a little more mindful of it rather than kind of defending maybe a point that I want to make or a point that I'd like to make or, or kind of flexing my knowledge because, you know, we all do that quickly when you meet someone new for the first time at a car show, cars and coffee, you know, meet whatever it is. Uh, it's kind of like a race to validate your knowledge, right? And I do that too. I mean, you know, show a car off and it's like, oh, sweet, brain dump. I'm going to dump all the stuff that I know. So then, you know, like, cool, I'm validated that you know that I know what's up. And I'm a car guy, you're a car guy. And I, you know what I mean? It's like, so we can all kind of like get our place. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's food for thought. You know, I'm rambling here, but uh, sometimes I like to share these observations because I, you know, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's an observation. You know, it's just something for us all to be mindful of. So we have, uh, so we have a good time. I'm not saying anything turned into like an argument or anything like that, but you know, sometimes it's just a little irritating. You know, when people are trying to uh, disprove you uh, when you're not trying to prove anything. You know what I mean? 
Uh, and really, like I said, observation, just from conversations I've seen, even other people have. I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, vent anything that happened to me directly because, quite honestly, the stuff doesn't really bother me. I just like, I like being around cars. No one's right or wrong. Everyone's allowed to be into whatever they want to. You want to LS swap a car, great. You want to keep it stock, awesome. You know, you want to drag the chassis off the ground, like, it's all good. You know, whatever makes you happy because we need all of these little facets to, to give us the resources to excel, to continue to create whatever we're into. You know, it's, it's, it's weird to think of, but yes, if you're into racing, you might knock people that are into show cars. They help, they, they help invigorate and fuel an industry that helps you get your parts for cheaper and get your track time and sponsorships that are, are paying for tracks and fixings. You know what I mean? Like we all kind of feed off each other indirectly. It all matters, you know? So anyways, preachy, I'm over it. Let's move on to the next. Uh, I don't want to take this too long, but uh, so at the beginning of the podcast, I was talking about just a couple of cars I want to touch on, um, you know, because I, I, I get emails, I get DMs all the time about uh, cars. When are they going to be legal? Are you seeing this? Are you seeing that? Uh, and first off, let me say, I am just uh, so thankful for anyone that reaches out to me, uh, that asks me questions, because I, I, that door's always open. I always mention it in the podcast. Uh, I mentioned it, um, I don't know if anyone's heard, I was the, a guest on the caffeine, Cars and Caffeine podcast. Check them out. Really good guys. Uh, just, you know, you're, you're, you're true car enthusiast, super humble. Uh, it's a good lesson, but, um, you know, and even, even like I said on that podcast, it's, um, I just want to help educate, right? I mean, obviously I'm trying to run a business. I'm trying to make money, but, uh, but I understand sometimes indirectly answering questions will lead to the heck goal, right? And, and getting back to people and just kind of helping them out because a lot of people just don't know where to start as much information as there is online. Sometimes you don't get really clear kind of answers when you call companies. Um, sometimes, you know, you're on forums and there's just so much information. I'm not saying it's bad, but there's just so much. It's hard to weed out the most direct way to whatever result you're trying to obtain. So, uh, so yeah, I, you know, I appreciate everyone emailing me and, uh, and really from all over, you know, I've had, I've had emails from Europe, uh, from Asia. Uh, you know, I'm just, um, I think there was one from, uh, which I need to get back to from Bangladesh. I mean, just, you know, really, really floored that there's, uh, that there's people in anywhere listening to me, let alone, uh, you know, in different continents. And, and I'm glad to answer any questions. And just, so you know, if you have sent me an email or uh, DMs, I usually get back to quicker just cause they're shorter. Uh, I like to be a little more thoughtful if you've asked me something specific on an email. So, uh, I can't always answer them right away when I read them, but I will get to you. Um, and, you know, a, a common question, and this is something, again, you can find easily, but let me just kind of put it out there since you're listening. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of questions about how can I get a car that's not 25 years yet? You know, a younger car for, uh, for the states. I mean, for, for those of you that live here, you know it's got to be 25 years or older to be federally legal. Um, you know, from, for those of you listening outside the country, that's, that's what we got. That's what we have to deal with. You know, Canada's 15 years, we're 25. I don't know what it is in other uh, parts of the world, but um, you know, we, we all have restrictions for any uh, reason. And obviously this one was really spearheaded because of um, the automotive companies. You know, I mean, it's, it's going to hurt their bottom line if uh, we have more options to get cars. And this was, I mean, decades ago that this was passed. This is not a new rule. So, um, uh, and we don't need to go into too many details there. I don't want to sit here and turn into like a, a news show on uh, big auto companies and, and kind of the lobbying to push uh, this law um, in Mercedes. And we won't name names, Mercedes. But anyways, uh, so, you, you know, these, uh, these questions about cars that are younger than 25 and it's a really, it's a really simple answer. And I think there's sometimes it's cloudy to people because you see cars on Instagram and shows, you'll see R34 Skylines, you'll see Sylvia's, uh, all these cars, you know, RX, uh, WRX's that are like a 97. I get it. There's absolutely cars in this country. A lot of them 
that are not 25 years old, but it's just simple. Uh, Unless they are a dealer, uh, a registered importer, uh, and a dealer, uh, chances are that there's something shady there and it's just not federally legal. Uh, So anybody that's just a consumer looking for a car, it's not, it could be state titled in certain states because everyone has a different rule, right? You can title it as a 240 in a state. Some states, it doesn't even matter. Florida, you could, you could title uh, a John Deere lawn tractor if you put turn signals on it in Florida. Like, I mean, every state's different, but just because it has a state title does not mean that you are exempt from uh, prosecution, you know, and yes, super long shot, right? Super long shot that someone would actually take an interest when you post a picture of your R34 online at whatever uh, recent show and, and will come seize it. But the bottom line is, if they want to, they can. Like, that's it, you know? So, uh, in the like I said, the only exemption to that, like, for instance, I could bring one in. I could bring in a, a, a much younger car, but it would have to be, for marketing purposes, it would have to be an elusive auto's name. Uh, there's, you know, restrictions on how you can drive and things like that. And I could not resell it. Like, legally, I just couldn't resell it. Unless, of course, I bought two. I crash test one. Uh, you know, went to the proper authorities. Had it reinspected. Had the modifications necessary for it to confirm to DOT. Had the smog for the uh, EPA. And spent, you know, probably four times, actually more than that, four times the car's cost to get it legal. So, obviously, no one's doing that. It just doesn't make sense, especially because the types of cars you do it for are starting to get expensive anyways. Like, everyone wants an R34. Well, guess what? We're not the only country that wants R34s. They want them in Japan still. They were much lower production numbers than uh, the 32s and 33s. And uh, they want them in Europe. So, we're all... It, it would it would never really make sense to do that. Uh, so, anyways, uh, just just to kind of put that to bed. If anyone has that question, uh, just know know now. I mean, if you're in the United States, it just it's not going to happen. And uh, and and I couldn't bring in even if you do have a company, even if you have a car dealership, I couldn't bring a car in for you uh, and sell it to you, even if you were using it for marketing reasons. The only way to do it is to uh, become a registered importer and importer uh, and do it yourself. You know, but uh, that costs a lot of money. You need to have a dealer. And again, you have to uh, agree that it's just for marketing reasons. So. uh, So anyways, moving on the uh, the cars. So some of the cars coming up, uh, you know, I get a lot of questions about R33s. Uh, So, yeah, they're available now. You know, they started making them in 93. Uh, They started. Well, when I say available now, you could technically get one. Uh, I think production started in August of 93, and this 25-year rule, it's not the year, it's a month. And they'll actually, when you're at the port, uh, Border Patrol, uh, and they actually taught me this uh, a while back, most cars, the seatbelt, uh, the driver's side seatbelt has a little tag on it. And check your car. I think you know most of ours in the States have this too. But it'll actually show you the production month. Um, I think there's other places to find it on the chassis, but that's a really easy way. You pop the door open, there's a little tag, and you can see the actual month. Uh, that your car was produced so and that's what they go by and you know if you pick up a car in june and it was produced in july like guess what you're in trouble uh they're holding it there and and you're gonna have to pay for it so uh so be mindful of that now you can like i've had cars the cedric i have uh was just legal in june and it's been on a boat for two months two weeks but uh you know, by the time it, it only really matters the, by the date it gets here that it lands in the United States. Uh, so you have a month of leeway, and most ports over there will give you a couple weeks free storage. Uh, and the storage isn't that bad. Like I've I've had opportunity to to store a car for you know four months before it was legal for way actually less than it would cost over here, uh, which was surprising. So uh, so yeah, the the R thirty threes are becoming. M- you're starting to see some that we could get in. Very few. Uh, the production production numbers were still pretty high in the 33s. You know, I think uh, 217,000 total in their run from 93 to 98. Just comparing that to the R32s, there was like uh, just under 300,000. So, and it definitely tapered when you get to the R34s. 
uh, 64 or 65,000 with our 34s. But um, so what's cool about the 33s, love them or hate them, uh, it's going to offer us a little variety. I think the 32s are always going to have a heart, uh, a spot in everyone's heart, mainly because, uh, I mean, power output, if you're comparing GTR to GTR, uh, it's it's very close. Uh, so what, two, I think 280? Actually, 280 on both of them. Now, there, there were some, uh, some different models available of the R33. There was even a 2.8 liter option. That only bumped it to like 300. Uh, I think it was, uh, what was the tuning? Pride. I think Pride. Don't quote me on that. It's like the type MR. But, um, but yeah, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, and the difference being a, a little bit of weight. I mean, it's heavier. They're about 200 pounds heavier on average, uh, 250 from the R32 to the R33 uh, GTRs. Now, the GTRs, and, and this kind of brings me into uh, the topic I want to hit on of cars that are going to be available soon because you can get the R33 now, but only in the GTS variant, which is the non-turbo, 130 horsepower. No, thank you. Uh, the GTS 25, which is the uh, RB25 DE, and then, of course, the GTS 4, which is the all-wheel drive version. Uh, again, underpowered, 190 or 200 horsepower, somewhere in there. And then there's the GTS 25T, which is a fun car. I mean, 250 horsepower, it's RB25. Uh, not a lot off the block, but, you know, it has the uh, this, the steel turbine turbo. Uh, it's, you know, single turbo, a little easier. To, you can get some life out of them. You know, some simple bolt-ons, you could uh, you could wake it up for sure. But, you know, I think the main push is going to be when the GTRs are available. And, and quite honestly, I mean, the body changes are just way sexier, in my opinion. But, uh, you know, there's two-door, there's four-door versions. Uh, so, so we'll see, we'll see more of these coming up. But for the GTR, we're still, we're still a couple years away. Uh, so September 95 was the first production for the GTR R33. So we're still, uh, well, we're about two years, two years and three months away, which seems like a lot, but I mean, hey, it, it'll go by. Uh, so there's a car that I wanted to talk about in this family. I don't know how you feel about wagons. I kind of like them. It's kind of it's one of those things that they're so ugly they're cool, you know, especially if done well. So there is, uh, and, and look this up if you're by your computer. S T A G E A. So the sta stagia stagia. Um, it's it's basically it's uh, it's a wagon. It's a Nissan Laurel. It's like based on the C thirty four wagon of the Laurel, but uh, similar chassis is the the four door same actually same chassis as the four door Skyline, but a wagon. So, uh, if you look at a picture of it, you know, from the front, it looks, it, it doesn't look that great, you know, because it's, uh, it's essentially a Nissan Laurel front. It's kind of like, uh, it looks like your typical grocery getter. But a very common mod is the uh, R34 swap, which um, I don't think requires much, if any, modification. I feel like it's fairly bolt on. If anyone knows, I mean, correct me, but uh, it's a very common mod. And, and if you've seen them before, you're like, oh, R34, like Skyline Wagon, it's sick. Technically never existed, but a very common mod. You know, it's headlights. You basically get the, uh, the OEM parts from an R34, and you can make, and I just think it's the coolest thing. And those things, um, those things are a couple years away, but uh, I am serious. Like, that is one of the, on the short list of shop cars. <laughs> that I want to do because I just think it would be uh, I mean it would be a way to have an R34 before an R34 but in a wagon state like I just I think it'd be awesome I don't know call me crazy but uh, but anyway so we have that uh, that coming up um, and uh, some rally rally cars coming up as well with the uh, the WRX which obviously we had here but there's some perks to have in the uh, the Japanese version and the uh, the Lancer, you know, so we're a little over, well, just under three years away from the Lancer 4, which is the, uh, you see Jackie Chan's Who Am I, kind of that iconic drive scene. And that was an Evo 4, uh, four or five, actually 4 or 5, I'm trying to think of what year that movie was made. It was probably a 4, because uh, they started, uh, 4 started in 96. But um, those are really going to change the game. I think we're going to see a lot of those. 
Uh, as long as they're kept in decent condition, they are uh, very prone to rust. I know I've looked at the Evo 2s, which are available um, uh, towards the end of the year, uh, which really no, no real difference between the ones uh, aesthetically that I can tell. I think there's some subtle, subtle changes, but uh, maybe the hood. But the Evo 2s, um, I'd like to find one of those. I really think that they'd, uh, they'd be a cool car to have. I mean, they're super small, uh, 260 horsepower or 250. Uh, you know, the GSR model, the RS model, which is just gutted and super light. And, uh, you know, has the, the 4G, uh, 4G motor in it. So it's um, a lot of parts available for it. You know, it actually shares a lot of parts with the uh, Mitsubishi Mirage, the, you know, the, the motor. There's a lot of cross-reference parts here. So that would be, that's going to be a fun car to see come into the States and, uh, and some tuners get their hands on those. Uh, so keep a lookout for the Evos. We're going to start seeing more, you know, the, the ones, like I said, the ones are legal now. There's just not many of them. I think we're going to see more of the twos, which will be legal towards the end of the year. Yeah, towards the end of the year. I think December, they're 94 uh, was their first production year, but uh, I think actual production was the end of 93. So, and that's what we go by. So I'm going to be looking for Evo 2s as long as I can find uh, some rust-free or, you know, even if it's just surface corrosion. Because uh, one thing I've found is, you know, in Japan, uh, a lot of times inspectors and uh, in my buyer as well, he, uh, like I've mentioned before, is very scrupulous, uh, as am I, but maybe even more so. He'll consider rust is something that we'll see like on a 2017 Civic, you know, just kind of your like surface corrosion on suspension parts that aren't aluminum. You know what I mean? Like under the car, I mean, very basic stuff or like some surface corrosion on some hardware under the car. Uh, I don't consider that rust. I consider that corrosion. Like I, I don't even consider that mentioning, but I'm glad he does. But anyways, um, you know, these these Evos are really known for heavy rust, so got to be on the lookout for that. But um, we're going to be seeing more of those. So they're going to be on the radar, uh, the Evo 2s. Obviously, we have a ways to go for the Evos 4s, which I think will be an explosion uh, because they're just way cooler. Uh, the R33s. And then, um, obviously, there's there's a lot more cars that are they're going to be uh, popping up soon, which I'll... Um, I'll kind of itemize in a different episode because I don't want to go too long here. But uh, the other car I want to talk about in closing, and it is available now. Not many of them out there. I do see them uh, time and time again uh, is the Enos Cosmo. So Mazda product, uh, very similar. Uh, so, you know, rotary engine, the same 13B engine in the RX-7. But the caveat is, you could also get one with Mazda's 20B REW, REW, which is their three rotor. For anyone that's been around those, uh, awesome motor for power. I mean, it's it gives you kind of the best of both worlds because the tunability of getting high horsepower, but mainly with the 13B lax and torque, the 20B makes up because the torque numbers are almost equal to the horsepower numbers. Uh, which I think are 300. Yeah, it's like 300 horsepower and like 297 uh, foot-pounds of torque, which is awesome for something that, uh, again, displacement's two liters, just a smidge under two liters. And uh, the efficiency there, it's mounted real low. And this isn't a, this isn't a sports car. This is a grand touring car. But uh, the body lines, I think, are, are just really appealing Timeless. Look, look it up if you're not familiar with them. It's uh, Series JC, but it's Enos Cosmo, so it's 1990 to 96. And I think this is an underrated car in the States here, at least. If I can find one, uh, they're kind of expensive with the 20B, but I think that's what makes them special. You know, you can find a 13B all day, any day uh, at dealers there. At auction, you don't see many coming up, but I, I could I could find one at a dealer, you know, in a week if I wanted to, but uh, not the 20B. The 20B... You know, it's uh, it's not quite as common, but just really cool interiors. I mean, all digital dash, kind of wraparound dash, really nice seats. They use a lot of, uh, which is rare in the day, uh, leather. It actually, not in the day. I mean, today. I mean, there's just not, leather's not. Someone told me once why. I, I can't remember the details, but uh, it's just not a popular thing in uh, overseas, or at least in Japan, in that area with these cars. So, uh, 
But yeah, I, I mean, really cool. You know, they did uh, either full leather or like a two tone, which is like kind of a fabric suede type center leather bolsters. Just like just beautiful interior. You know, I mean, it's uh, it it doesn't look dated. I'd say the only thing that's dated in the interior is the steering wheels. The steering wheels are kind of like uh, best way to describe it. It's like a flat bottom steering wheel, but round. Like the center mass of the steering wheel is is not centered on the actual circle on the actual rim of the wheel. So it makes it look kind of tall and awkward. And I imagine when you're like driving it, it might be a little weird, but uh, swap that out, put a wooden arty in and it'd be awesome. But yeah, I mean like subtle wood trims, this wraparound digital ga- dash and just uh, some really nice finishes on the door sills, that plush, plush carpet, uh, just s- some really cool stuff there. And I think it's um, for someone that wants a car that looks really cool that, we never had in the States that is going to be a head turner, but also just a good cruiser. You know, like if you, if if you don't need to be uh, taking something to the track, obviously you don't want something like this because it's, it's a large touring car, uh, two door, but still large. It's, I I mean, I'd say equivalent for, uh, for those of you in the States, the uh, SC 300 or SC 400 of the same year, you know, uh, in similar weight and stuff like that. But this one just, uh, Really refined car. I mean, the um, the headlights, taillights. I think the body lines are gorgeous. The uh, the the pillars are usually the uh, a pillars usually black, and the roof in the uh, in in down to the quarters is uh, body colored, which kind of gives this cool uh, kind of wraparound window look in the front of it, like uh, like you'll see in like some supercars. Uh, I, I just think there's some great design touches to this, and and really what puts it over the top is man, if you can get one with a 20B. Like, come on, you know, that just, that, that'd be a fun car. Like, that would be a fun road trip car, car show car, uh, you know, even daily driver. Because, again, you take care of an RX, you take care of a rotary, it'll take care of you, you know. Let it warm up. Uh, I know it's old school, but throw a turbo timer on it if you don't want to sit there. Like, if you need to move it in your driveway and flop the turbo timer on five minutes and just walk away, you know. Um, these are things that, that, uh, that is, is sensitive to the, to the seals and, you know, people complain about the apex seals and longevity. A lot of that is because people starting and moving and turning off and oil not coming up to temperature or starting getting on the highway and, and getting after it. You know, if you live close to an exit or something, uh, without it properly being warmed up. So you take care of them, you know, they'll be in shape. And again, troubleshooting is not the end of the world. Uh, a lot of cross-reference parts for that motor still in the States, uh, in, in many other parts of the world. So, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to talk about that. It's, it's a car I like, and anytime I mention it, no one, if they say, oh, yeah, the Cosmo, like, they either don't know and they're just trying to go along with it, or they, or, or they haven't heard of them, you know? And, uh, I mean, heck, you, you know, if 80% of you've heard of them before, you're probably like, shut the hell up. I don't need you to tell me about the Cosmo. I know about it. But I just want to share, you know, a cool car, that is available now, uh, harder to find. And as we see more and more of these right-hand drive cars creeping into the States, it's nice to see, uh, it'll be nice to see some different options like this, you know, because we all want Sylvia's and Skylines and RX-7s and 300Zs, but I think uh, I think there's some other nice options that, uh, that might be overlooked, you know, uh, for, for those that are looking for something different and show car cruiser and, you know, don't need to be uh, putting out 800 horsepower and roll cage in the thing. You know, so anyways, let's close this one out. Went a little long. Not, uh, actually, not as hard as I thought talking by myself for almost an hour. But, uh, you know, hopefully you got something out of this. As always, uh, hit me up on on social. Uh, If you have questions, I mean, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, Elusive Auto Co. on all those platforms. So, uh and then, uh, then of course, uh, I'm starting to put some videos up on the YouTube channel, and uh, it's another way to listen to the podcast as well. You know, just if you're on there and you just want to listen, uh, you can you can hop over to Elusive Auto Co. on YouTube, and uh, and feel free to email me uh, sales at elusiveautoco.com, and I'll answer your questions. You know, and if uh, if you see some in inventory you're curious about, I'll do a walk around video for you. If uh, you want me to find a car. Be sure to inquire about the purchasing program. It is completely all-inclusive. You will have access to thousands of cars that you pick 
that I source and completely legalize and have it here stateside ready for you with a state title. Uh, and it'll be no different than buying any other used car. So um, I think that's a program that uh, that should do well, you know, for people that have the patience to wait for something to ship over and, uh, and don't want to settle for what's out there in my inventory or anyone else's. So, uh, so hit me up. Look forward to hearing from you out there. Enjoy the drive. <laughs>